new life. Those of you who are here in the sanctuary and those of you who are online with us this morning, and we just thank God that you are here and that we are able to be here. Um, you know, this song, if you think about it, better is one day in his courts, better is one day in his house than thousands elsewhere. I don't know about you, but when I'm in the presence of the Lord, there is no better place to be. I don't care if you're married to the perfect man, if you have the perfect children, the perfect job or whatever, it still does not compare to being in the presence of the Lord. And several years ago, I was going through a very, very rough time in my life. And the song, Here in His Presence, came on. And the Lord spoke to me when it says, Here in your presence, we are undone. And you know, sometimes we get to the point and we're like, I'm done. I'm done. I'm giving up. I'm done. But in His presence, He says, mm, No, it's not done. You're not done. I've got things in store for you. I've got things to do. And then sometimes we get ourselves done up, if you know what I'm saying. We make bad choices. We do wrong things like humans do, you know. And we are done up in ourselves. But in His presence, He undoes all of what we have done to divert us from the path that the Lord has given us, that the Lord has placed us on. So I'm just here to encourage you this morning. If you have come done up, or if you have come saying, I am done, His presence, if you will allow His presence, allow His presence, He's not going to come in and take over. He's, he gives you the choice. He is a gentleman, and it's your choice if you allow the presence to make a difference in your life. He will undo us if we allow it. So just pray with me as we cover our service in prayer and, uh, and as we praise the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you for who you are, Father. Not for all the things that you have done, but for who you are. You are God Almighty. You are El Elyon, God Sovereign. You are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. You are Jehovah Shalom, our peace. You are Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. You are El Shaddai. You are Jehovah Tesitkanu. You are everything father that we need you are i am that i am and i just praise you this morning father that we can come into your presence and that your presence can make just the world of difference in our lives father and i ask that your holy spirit would go forth and would touch each and every heart here and each and every heart online father that you would teal up the soil that's in our heart father to receive the word the seed that pastor john has to give us this morning that you have given him and ask, Father, that you would water it and let it grow in us so that we can grow closer to you and that we will have life and have it more abundantly. And we give you all honor and glory and praise in Jesus' name. Fail me now in the way. 
waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out You're working all things out Yes, I will lift you high In the lowest valley Yes, I will bless your name is heavy all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will. And I choose to pray to glorify, glorify the name of all
saw the Lord sound like a strange question to to somebody when you say aren't you glad he's holy but 
here's the thing if he's not holy we don't have hope but because he is holy then all our hope is in him and it's in the best place it can be because he can never fail he's never failed not one single time and he never will amen he's holy he's righteous he's good he's God amen amen aren't you glad that he's on the throne yeah now I know some people have an issue with that in fact I would venture to say that the greatest issue that that people have in this world with submitting to God is the fact that they want to be in control how many of you think that that's fair yeah how many of you have found out that when your life is, is, is messed up the most, it's because you look and you see that you've been in control of just about everything? Right? Now, that's nothing against your ability or your intelligence or your gifting or any of that. But the fact of the matter is, He's God and we're not. And if we try to control it all, if we try to be in charge of it all, if we try to take care of everything, we're going to mess it up because we are not able to do those things. See, those names that Sherry was mentioning earlier, those are descriptors. Those are, <clears throat> you know, people say, well, I didn't know God had so many names. You know, he gave us those names so we can understand his character, his ability, his, 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 his gifting, if you will. All gifts are in him. And so when he says, this is who I am, when I'm Jehovah Jireh, that, that word means I am the Lord who provides. If you try to provide, you're not Jehovah Jireh. You're, you're, you're limited. You're going to go so far and that's it. And you say, well, I've done okay so far. Well, you know what? Well, here's the problem. You're going to get to a point in some area and you're stuck. Because you have no ability to go beyond that. But he does. Not only can he go beyond that, he can go beyond more than you can imagine or think. I love the scripture that says... Now unto him, I think it's Galatians chapter 5 verse 1, now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. It may be a different scripture now that I'm thinking about it, but anyways, it's, it's that scripture says he is able to do above and beyond. Above and beyond all that we could ask or think. And I studied that before. And here's what it means. And if you think about this, I've said this different times, and I want to remind you of this again today. If, if, you, if you think about what that means, it's so incredible because it, it actually says he's talking about all of us, all of mankind. So if you could take the collective imagination of all of mankind, everybody who's ever lived and everybody who ever will live, and put it all together, God is able to do above and beyond that. We have some amazing stuff in this world, don't we? You ever stopped and look at some of the things that we have and technology and inventions and all of that and you think, there's some really smart people in this world. Anybody besides me figured out there's some really smart people in this world? Yeah? Are y'all awake? Y'all y'all, up? Okay. I'm just saying, when I look around and think, wow, how did they think about that? How did they imagine that? Where did they come up with that? And then I look at this world and this universe, and I think about how it all works together and how all the different things that make the earth spin and the sun <coughs> do what it does and the stars and the moon and then the universe and the universes and all the things that are there and then you start thinking about simple things that we think are simple like how the wind blows we take that for granted don't we I don't I can't understand it can you I don't know where it goes I don't know where it comes from I just know it's there and then I think about how my body works together and how everything intricately is connected. And if one little chemical is out of balance, if one little thing is out of, if I, is, is out of place, if, if, you know, and you think about all the different workings of, you ever study the eyeball, anybody? It's amazing. It's amazing when you think about things like that. And, and, and y'all, you know, 
you go, all of that came from God. His a mind, his imagination, his ability. And he didn't have to take millions and millions of years to do it. He didn't have to go consult anybody. He didn't have to conjure up a bunch of stuff or work real hard or have a team to do it. He just said, this is what I want. And it happened. As amazing as our body is, I want you to think about this now. Now, some people think I'm crazy when I say this, and that's fine because I don't really care what people think about me. I believe what the Word of God says. The Bible says He formed us from the dust of the earth and then breathed life into us. The Ruach, the breath of God who is also known as the Holy Spirit. And today is Pentecost Sunday. When we celebrate the giving of the Holy Spirit to us. When God said, not only am am I going to give you all of these things and make you like I make you, but I'm not satisfied with that. I'm not just going to redeem you. I'm going to live in you and I'm going to walk with you everywhere you go and I'll help you. And when you can't, take care of it when it's beyond your control when it gets past your ability I am going to be not just beside you I'm going to be inside you in your mind in your thoughts in your emotions in your spirit I'm going to be all over where you are that's good news that's good news amen that's very 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 good news Because I don't have to depend on me. Now you may have a high opinion of me. Some of you probably don't. Based on some of the emails I get, I know some of you don't. But that's all right. I'm good with that too. It's really not that bad. It's just a few. Just them few always seem to stick out more, don't they? I refuse to accept that. Sometimes I get so tired of it, I write myself emails. You're so good. You know... I do. Hey, the Bible says encourage yourself in the Lord. I'll send me emails from the church. You know what I'm saying? I got control of both those email accounts. They come to my inbox. So I just, dear Pastor John, what a powerful message that was. You so smart. You so pretty. Right? I'm just saying what God thinks about me. And some of y'all think that's silly or arrogant or whatever, but, but the Lord thinks that about me. The Lord thinks I'm smart. The Lord, the Lord thinks I'm beautiful. The Lord thinks I'm, I'm fantastic. He thinks so much of me, He gave His only Son for me. And that's the way He feels about you. And I'm glad. And I started saying, I'm glad that He's that way because I know me. It doesn't matter how high of an opinion I have of me or how high of an opinion you have of me. The fact of the matter is, I know where I'm limited and I know where I'm going to mess up. But when I get to the end of myself, when I get to that place that I can't do it and I know I'm about to blow it and I'm about to lose it. And when I do blow it and when I do lose it, I know I can trust and depend in Him. If I fail to call on him to help me beforehand, I know he's there to help me get up. Come on, somebody. That's a reason to shout. He's there always. He's holy. He's holy. Holy is connected to glory. And I studied this one time and figured out. I wanted to figure out because people would say, fill this place with your glory, Lord. You know, in the the Old Testament, they said when the high priest would go in into the Holy of Holies and and he would make that sacrifice on the Day of Atonement, the Bible said the Shekinah glory, that means the visible, tangible glory of God would show up in that place and everybody around would know it. And I wanted to figure out what is the glory of God? It's not just some shiny thing. It's not just smoke and, and, and all of that. It's not thunder and lightnings, even though the Bible says that a lot of that is compared or, or, or in, in, in described in God, right? 
So I wanted to figure out what the glory of God is. And if I can tell you, with all the different research and the different references and things that I looked up, here's what I'm going to give you. The simplest definition I can of what the glory of God is. The glory of God is everything that makes God, God. Everything that makes God, God. And see, holiness is connected to His glory. And His glory is connected to His holiness. And so when He comes on the scene, because He's holy, His glory shows up with Him. And because you trust in Him, because He's holy, you also get everything that's, that makes Him God. When you are belonging to Him and He says, I am the Lord your God and I am holy. And now listen to this, catch this one. He says, because I'm holy... You shall be holy. (laughs) That's not just a commandment. Some people say, oh, how am I going to do that? No, 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 no. You need to understand first and foremost, before that's something you got to do, that's something you're able to do. Before that's something you need to think about, that's something you can just be in Him. He said He's made you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You have the glory of God. All over you. The presence of God lives in you. So I know when times get hard, when times get rough, it's been a rough week for us. Many of you know the circumstances we've been going through. It's not been as rough on me as it has been on Lori. But when I come to those places and I get to the end of myself, And I don't know what to do and I don't know who to trust into. All I have to do is say, God, oh God, you can do this. I'm trusting in you. I'm depending on you. I'm looking to you. And he says, I've got you, son. I've made promises to you. I'm taking care of it because I'm holy. Because I'm holy. Now you can see when Isaiah looked into the throne room. He was able to peer into the throne room of God. And he saw the holiness and the glory of God. The first thing he said is, Woe is me. Woe is me. And God said, That's all right. Because it's not about you. I've got you. Come on, somebody. If that's helping you, can you give the Lord a hand of praise? He's worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord Jesus. For you are holy and righteous. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. Praise you, Jesus. Holy. So much so that the Bible says that there are angels. And I want you to understand this. This is not their job. It's not what they've been told they have to do. You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes we get a look, glimpse in heaven and we think, well, these angels, that's what they do. That's what they've been told. No, they do this because they can't help but do this. They're in the presence of God. They're in the throne room. And the Bible says that all they do is fly around and shout back and forth from each other. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And as soon as one finishes, another one starts going, holy, holy, holy. And as soon as that one finishes, the other one says, let me tell you what, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You understand what I'm saying? And this has been going on for eons. Worthy, holy, That's who He is. That's who your Heavenly Father is. That's who your God is. That's who your Savior is. That's who you have trusted in. That's who's taking care of you. And let me ask you after saying all of this, there's one reason I want you to understand all of this. If He is all of that, then what in your life is there is that that He cannot do? If He is all of that, then what do you have to be worried about? The Bible says if God is for us, then who can be against us? He has no foe. You understand that, right? 
Well, he's the enemy. You know, to, 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 I know the devil hates God, but here's the thing. It, it, when I understand and, uh, and, and, just, and, 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 and think about historically an enemy, an enemy is somebody who can oppose me. There are people that hate God. There are, there are forces that Satan himself hates God. But there is nothing that can oppose him. He has no equal. There is no one beside him. Did you understand what I'm saying? He's God. He is the Lord God Almighty. Amen? Amen. One more time, can you give him praise? Worthy. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Clay, y'all go ahead and bring this over here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get going. While they're transitioning there, I want to say um, thank you so much to all of you who have, first of all, been praying for uh, Sister Lori, Pastor Lori, and uh, <clears throat> not only for those who have been praying, but those who have, who have called, text. You know, I know sometimes we don't answer because of what's going on, perhaps, um, but your prayers have been felt. And I want you to know, even if it's just a little bit at a time, she's getting better. Amen. 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 She's getting better. The doctor's report was, was very positive, and, uh, and we believe the report of the Lord. Amen. And so it's just going to be now just a matter of time and, uh, and, and living through. Uh, unfortunately, there are some things that happen in our life that we have to, we have to just go through. And, uh, and so it's just some time and, and, and unfortunately some pain. Um, and I just believe that the Holy Spirit is helping her and that God is taking care of this. Amen? Amen. And thank you for all of you who have provided uh, meals and helped us and, and done things and, and get people back and forth and doing those type of things. And we surely appreciate that. Be praying. Continue to pray as we move forward in this. And, uh, and I know that that God is on the throne, and He, the same God I was speaking to you about is the same one taking care of us. Amen? And I'm glad that He uses our church family to bless us and help us. And so I just wanted to stop for a second. She's not here, but I know for a fact because she's already texted me. She's already commenting on our live stream. She's watching, and she knows, and, and, uh, and, and, and trust me, I hear her when she prays for you. And you want her praying for you because she's a praying woman. She is a praying woman, so it's so good. It's so good to uh, to to be here today. I wanted to be home with her, but um, Seth man's there with her, and I know he's going to take care of her, right? He uh, he's a he's a he's a gentle spirit, if if I can put it that way. He's a sweet, sweet young man. Um, but you want to see him get fired up. I've only seen it a couple of times. It comes out in him, but when, when he when he perceives something happening with his mama, he disregards body, he disregards safety, he disregards everything. So I know he, he knows where things are and he's gonna take care of business. Amen. So thank you, Seth man. I know you I know you're watching too, and I appreciate you being there with mama. So anyhow, I'm glad you're here. Are you glad to be here? Yeah? I bet you'd better be here than the best hospital on the planet. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, hey, I want to do a couple of things real quick. Let me first give you an opportunity to worship the Lord with tithe and offering and, uh, and giving. You can uh, do that several different ways. If you go to our website, there's actually they're all listed there or on our mobile app. And there's, there's some instructions how to take care of that. You can text to give. You can, you can put it in the, uh, some of you have done that already. There's, there's uh, receptacles, uh, plates on, on your way out the door. You can, you can give there if you haven't done that and you brought it with you. Or you can mail it in, whatever. Continue to give and bless the Lord. Amen? Now, if you look around, you can see summer starting, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's all right. We got more than two or three, so we're going to worship Jesus. And he's here with us. I don't get discouraged. Y'all, listen, people said, does it bother you when people are quiet? Nope, it don't. Does it bother you when people are, you know, there's just a few people here? It don't. It used to, but it don't no more. And I just go back to this. I was a youth pastor for 12 and a half years. So I, I, I'm used to it all. You know what I'm saying? When you deal with middle school and high school kids for 12 and a half years, 
You learn, don't you? Some of y'all are looking at me like, what do you mean? Let me stick you in there. You'll figure it out. So I, I, I like it. I like it when there's people here because it, it, it just we worship better together. Amen? Amen? And I want people to be in the house of God. I want people to be worshiping the Lord together as a family. And I like it when you talk back because it makes it better for me. I don't know that I go any... I might go faster, but I don't know if I go shorter. I claim I do sometimes, but I don't know that I actually do. Sometimes it just fires me up more, you know what I'm saying? You what now? There you go. I'll just throw it out there. Y'all deal with it. How about that? I'm glad that I don't have to be the editor. I'm just the messenger. Amen? But, um, but I, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm thankful I'm thankful for how faithful you guys are. I know God's faithful. And he's faithful to you. And because he's faithful to you, and uh, you're faithful to him, and then things happen. And I, I have this saying, I, I picked this up from a buddy of mine last year um, when we started in COVID. And, and I just want to continue to make sure that you understand this. When you're given to new life, you're really given through new life. Right now, right now, you may not be aware of everything that's going on, but we are able to bless families. We're taking care of things. We're helping people with lost income. We're helping people with meals. We're helping people with financial bills. We're helping people with transportation and, and getting help and doing the things that they need to do. We are able to do that because God is faithful and we are faithful to do what God has asked us to do. Amen? So continue to be faithful, and thank you for that. Speaking of faithfulness, let me just go ahead and tell you that while today is also Pentecost Sunday, today is also Graduate Recognition Sunday, and we are honored. Yes, yes, yes. We are honored to have with us this morning two very distinguished graduates, and uh, we're going to start with our high school graduate so how do we want to do this? Uh, where is Kristen? Kristen, we want to bring her down first to do the video after, or we want to do the video first and, and, and bring her down after? Yes, she says. You're no help at all. Her kids are too young. You know what I'm saying? She, Austin hadn't put her in practice long enough. Usually we go ask your mom, and she has the answer. So video first. All right, let's watch the video. Turn it up a little.
Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. So, Krista Hanna, why don't you come on down? Two thousand twenty one high school graduate. Amen. Amen. Little gift for you and a card there. And uh, we're so proud of you. Isn't she pretty in her stuff? They said that did Krista need to wear her stuff? I said, No, but she can. <laughs> you know what? When I was when I graduated, you pay so much for this stuff, I wanted to wear it everywhere. You know what I'm saying? Can I, wear it to, can I wear it to the Walmart, you know, right? It, you'd be better looking than most people in Walmart. That's the truth. <laughs> We're so proud of you. Congratulations for your hard work and dedication. And we know that God has amazing things in store for you. Y'all, stretch your hands this way. I want to pray for her, would you? We're going to pray together. Father, thank you so much for your faithfulness and your goodness to Krista and her life, Lord. Thank you for her mom and her grandparents and her siblings and her dad and all the people around her, God, who have poured into her, her teachers, her, her friends even, Lord God, and, it, and, and for you and your spirit most of all that have brought her to this place. Lord, her hard work, her, her determination, um, even her struggle, God, has all been worth it. And so now he, she has taken this, this, this step and, and reached this culmination. We are made aware, God, and, and not to thrust her too fast into the next thing because we want her to enjoy this accomplishment. But God, we, we become acutely aware that this threshold is only the beginning of another amazing journey. And so I just thank you for what you're going to do in our life. I'm excited to look and to see what's happening and, and how you're leading her, how you use her, how, her ministries here in this church. And God, I thank you. I thank you for all that, you, that, that, that you've done for her and all that she is in you. And so bless her in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Look at all these tassels. Now. What's all these tassels mean? Do you know? There you go. One's for band, two are for scholarship, and two are for honors. So there you go. Very good, very good, very good. Amen. Amen. Now, I, I, I know I'm putting you on the spot, and if you don't know, just say you don't know. But do you have any idea what's coming next? Yes, I'm going to GCSU. Okay, GCSU, what are you going to study? Um, I'm going to major in theater and minor in dance. Major in theater and minor in dance. Amen. And so... And just so happens, we have lots of places for that ministry to take place too. Amen? Amen. Not only can she make money, but she can bless the Lord. She's already got all kinds of ministries that she's been involved in since she was so little. And so, um, Nikki, congratulations to you. Well done. And for you, well done. Well done. I love you. All right. All right. We have one more graduate we're going to recognize no video for this one we don't do videos for the college graduates because they get them when they graduate from high school and they don't want to just they're like eh, whatever anyways right but this one uh, is special to all of us super special to me because it happens to be my daughter and uh, so Haley Milam congratulations to you on graduating and uh, Lee University come on up here and um, huh? she said, this is heavy, yes, because it costs money, that's why. <laughs> Not too much. <laughs> we buy heavy things so it feels like it costs a lot of money. It feels expensive, that's right. No, we just, a little something from your church family to let you know how proud we are of you. Not just as your dad, but also your pastor. And... Uh, Graduated with a Bachelor of Science in, um, what's it called? Pre-professional biological science. Pre Pre biological science. There it is right there. 
That means pre-med, and her next steps will be in just a little while. She's going to take a little time off. COVID set some things behind, and she wants a little break anyways, and so she'll be headed to medical school, so keep praying for her. But anyways, congratulations. So proud of you, and uh, I love you. You know that. Give her a hand, will you? Good job. Excellent. I couldn't have done it. I'm tell you that much. I graduated from college um, several, 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 several years ago. Um, and and they, when Haley was graduating, she had all these tassels on her, too, and ribbons. And her GPA was higher when she graduated than mine was before I even started. You know what I'm saying? Um, and, and then people were like cum laude and summa cum laude. And what was the other one? Magna cum laude. You know what I'm saying? I graduated, thank the Lord. <laughs> that's, that's how I graduated. So, um, anyhow, that's, uh, that's, there you go. So, anyways, look, I'm getting text messages from Lori. Pray for her. Okay, yes, I forgot to pray for Haley. Come here. <laughs> she texted me a little while ago when I walked to the side. Video first. <laughs> Thank you, baby. I appreciate it. This is usually what happens when she's sitting down here when y'all know I can't read lips. And I go, what? <laughs> Do the video. <laughs> so anyways, I forgot to pray for you. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm terrible, Dad. Okay, I do pray for you all the time. Stretch your hands this way and let's pray for her, would you? Father, I just thank you for Haley, not only because she's my, my daughter, Lord, but because she's your daughter. And I pray for, you, for, for her that you would touch her. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness to her, for all the, her hard work and dedication and commitment and the struggle that she had gone through to get to where she is now. What an amazing step. And God, while in, in many lives this is the, the next step into the rest of the life, in the career for her, there's another step coming. And so I just pray you would continue to guide her, lead her as she studies for the tests that are coming up, God, for the interview and the application processes of what you have for her to do, Lord, for the interim times. Put her in the right school, put her in the right program around the right professors and the right people to do exactly what you want to happen in her life. We thank you for that. We bless you, Lord, and we ask you to bless her in Jesus' holy and wonderful name. Amen, amen, amen. I love you. Love you. All right. Sorry, Krista, I know I didn't kiss you, but it's okay. She's probably going, thank you, Jesus. You know? <laughs> All right. Hey, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to the book of Acts. Everybody know where Acts is? Yeah? Okay. And we're also going to look at one scripture. You, there, I don't have a... Uh, oh, our young people can be dismissed. Yeah, they were here. I'm still getting used to it. It's only been a year and a half. They're back there like, hey, let us go before you start that stuff. Yeah, our young people can be dismissed. Bless y'all. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Looks like they have a party back there today. So I wish I, wish I was going back there, but it's okay. All right. Hey, um, today, this is what I'm going to do. We have Pentecost Sunday, and so what I want to do is I want to, um, I want to combine this, this Pentecost Sunday message, and it's, I want to do it a little bit different than I ever have done before. Now, next week, um, we have what they call Youth Takeover, um, what I like to call Bold Sunday. Um, we have our youth service and Pastor Kristen's going to be preaching. Yeah, she's excited. You can tell she's excited, right? She's scared like crazy, but she's going to do good. I'm excited for her. I can remember the first time I ever preached. Don't you remember the first time you ever preached? I mean, it's nerve-wracking sometimes. But, you know, here's the thing. God does not call us without equipping us. And everything he asked us to do, he helps us do. I just was talking about that. Maybe that was just for you, so you can live all week in that. Amen? Amen. So I'm excited about it. Our young people will be helping lead next week. And then following that, I'm going to do a little mini-series on Pentecost and the Holy Spirit. And, and however God leads, they're just, there's, I've done it so many different ways in the past. And I'm, I'm prepared and getting ready to do that 
um, and it's all coming together well. But today I thought what I would do is, because I don't have, you know, I, I don't know, I, to me I like to work in, in, the, in the momentum of a series. That's just the way God made me. And so, but what today I wanted to do is kind of bring some things about Pentecost, um, and, and I want to kind of segue into that with this graduate recognition, because you know, here's the thing, um, graduation doesn't just happen. You don't just kind of show up every day and then all of a sudden, Haley, you know, Krista knows this for a fact, with high school, Haley has learned this acutely well um, through college, and, and she realized that there was a lot of hard work, and I know as her dad, you know, in high school, it's like, you know, go there, do your work, and, you know, maybe have a little issue, but in college, it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of things that just start coming together, and you plan on your own, and they don't tell you, hey, your book report's due next week, right? They don't. They just, they just say, you know, matter of fact, they may not ever even mention it. They may not ever, ever mention. You may have a professor that never says, this is when your assignment's due, but it's due. And if you don't do it, you're going to fail. Because they expect you to take care of these things. They expect you to be committed and be faithful and, 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 and do the things that you need to do and to take care of. And then sometimes you got to do extra, and sometimes you got to go talk to a, a, a professor and say, hey, what can I do to help with this, or I need some help in that. And, 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 and what I'm saying is, you got to do more than just show up. Amen? In high school and in college and, and, and in life. And here's the thing, as powerful as God is and as powerful as He makes us in Him, Sometimes all we have to do is just be there, but there are other times where we got to do more than just show up. Amen? And so what I want to do today is talk about kind of what happened, how all of this took place, and how all of this came about to get us to what we know as the day of Pentecost or, or, or when the Spirit, Holy Spirit came, because there were people that had to do things. You know, God made a promise a long time ago. Peter talked about it. When, and, and when he told through the prophet Joel, he said, there's going to come a day when I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. You know, in the Old Testament, what God did was he only um, showed up in, in, in the power of his, of his Holy Spirit and his presence like that. In very few and occasional situations and times. We read through the Bible when we read all these things and we think it was like all the time, right? Do like this because you read it and it seems like back to back because you read every chapter. But what you don't realize is there's thousands of years between some of those chapters. Hundreds of years between this one and that one. And, and God didn't do things with every person. And they worshiped the Lord. And they had to trust other people, and they had to follow what they saw sometimes. Even when God was with the Israelites, and He was a pillar of fire by day and cloud by night, that's different than seeing something there and having something here. Amen. Right? Amen. Or having someone here, better said. But then God made a promise, and He said, I'm going to pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. And these, there's going to be some things that happen. Man, people are going to have dreams and visions. And I'm going to bring power like you've never seen before. And, and, and everything's going to change. And I'm kind, of, I'm kind of talking retroactive because I saw what happened after the fact. But how many of you realize that there, there are promises that God makes? And God's going to keep those promises. But it doesn't matter what God does if nobody's there to receive it. Right? And you say, well, I don't understand that because God has put a lot of things in our hands. Sherry said this earlier as well. He's a gentleman. He's given us choice. He's given us the option to submit to Him, to surrender to Him, to, to, to be used by Him, to be infilled by Him, to be blessed by Him. Or we can choose our own way and do our own thing and, and wind up in our own problem. That's a fact. But, you know, it's like when I tell my children, if you meet me at so-and-so, 
I, 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 I'll say, you know, I, I'll say, all right, you know, now see, John David is 24. He's working and drives cars and gets off and, and can do what he wants to do most of the time. And Haley's kind of the same way, 21 years old now, college graduate back home. I know that's probably a different little adjustment for her, even though hopefully she's glad to be around us. She's lived on her own for four years, you know, with roommates and different things. But she didn't have mom and daddy there taking care of her, making meals and doing all that stuff. She was, you know, four and a half hours away from us. Well, four hours is four and a half the way I drive, not necessarily how she drives. It's amazing how fast she can drive four and a half hours. But anyhow, she's like, yeah. But now she's here and, you know, and there's somebody else involved now. And he's a good guy. I had somebody ask me the other day when he was over at the house. We had a little party for Seth on Friday um, for his birthday. We had to put it off and bless her heart. Lori, she just had to sit in the house in the recliner and watch from through the window but uh, me and Haley and Cody pulled it off, didn't we? And uh, we, we were there. And Lori did quite a bit, believe it or not, more than she should have, um, in fact. Um, but one of my buddies was there, and he, he saw Haley and Cody, and he, he didn't know Cody. And so he looks, he goes, he's been knowing me a long time. He said, you approve of that one? <laughs> I said, he's all right. <laughs> I said, yes, I do. He's great. So he really is. He really is a fine young man. And, uh, and, and I've been knowing him since he was that big. Actually, that big. <laughs> That's his nephew right there. Hey, everybody, when you get an opportunity, don't get right up in his face. But, but RJ's here, first time ever. So praise the Lord for that. That's Kevin and Sherry's grandson. And, uh, and his mama's here too, Mel. We're glad to have you guys with us. And, uh, but anyhow, um, so my point is, I'll say, uh, hey, mom's making so-and-so for dinner, or I'm grilling so-and-so, and they go, oh, that's good. And then dinner time comes, and guess what? They're not there. You know? Now, here's the deal. At 24 and 21, we don't go, hey, where are you? Dinner's on the table. I go get Seth, and I say, it's time to eat. And we eat. And we put it up. And if they show up and go, hey, hey, what happened to those ribs? I'm like... What's left is in the refrigerator. You should have been here. Right? I just assume they're taking care of themselves, or, or I don't know, as long as, as long as I know they're okay, if I, at some point I'll find out, right? As long as the police or somebody ain't knocking on my door, I'm not stressing about it. Here's the point. I can provide it, but they have to be there to receive it. And see, the whole point is this. You know, just like the, these, these, these graduates have worked and, and the education was there and it was given and provided and helped with, they had to work to do something. They had to, they had to receive. And so there were some things that happened at Pentecost that brought us to where we are now. Now, beginning in two weeks, we're going to talk about what all that means and the power we have and many of the gifts and what Pentecost means to a modern-day believer. But I want to just kind of just go over some of the stuff of Pentecost, maybe not some of the stuff you've never thought of before. I don't know if this will be any fun to you or exciting to you. I do feel like the Lord laid it on my heart for some reason or another. And so today we're going to look at Pentecost then and now. And we're going to take a look at some stuff that we can glean from this that will help us in our own lives right now. Is that good? Amen. I'm going to do it anyways, whether it's good or not. So here's the thing. What do we see about this day of Pentecost from the scriptural account? Well, first we know from Acts chapter 2 verse 1 um, that some of Jesus' followers were gathered in the same place, right? So stay with me. Stay with me. Um, where were they gathered? Well, Luke doesn't directly specify <coughs> where the disciples were gathered in his, in, in his particular passage. However, um, it's likely that Luke intended for his readers to understand that the disciples were still meeting in the same place that they had been meeting. Now, where were they meeting? There was 120, the Bible says, that were in what we now call the upper room. But which upper room was that? Have you ever wondered about that? Probably not. None of, anybody, anybody ever wondered? I wonder about that upper room. Where was that upper room? Was this the same upper room where they had the Last Supper? Was it? 
Hmm. So Luke assumes, because he doesn't really describe, he doesn't give us any explanation whatsoever, he assumes that his readers would know which upper room he's talking about. The most likely location is the same upper room where Jesus ate with his disciples just before he was crucified. This was the room that they had been given permission to be in. And since his disciples continued to have access to this upper room, um, <clears throat> and it was the home, uh, it, it was kind of there where they were staying after Jesus' death and burial and resurrection and ascension, it's possible um, that it belonged to one of Jesus' disciples. And when I say that, I don't mean one of the 11 or 12, but it belonged to a follower of Jesus. How many of you know that Jesus had more than 12 disciples? Did you know that? Did you know that Jesus had 70 disciples that he sent out two by two to do ministry? Do you know that he had more than 70 disciples? Do you know what a disciple means? See, when we think about disciples, most of the time we think about what? The apostles, right? We think about those 11 and then Matthias who was chosen to take his place and then Paul who comes along later who formerly was Saul of Tarsus and we think about those guys who were apostles but a disciple means a follower and so Jesus literally had thousands of disciples and, and believe it or not everywhere he went hundreds if not thousands of people followed him all over the place. He was a big deal. He was bigger than the Beatles and Elvis put together. Or whoever's famous right now. I don't know who was famous right now, but those are kind of like the biggest ever. You know, Michael Jackson thought he was big, but he never was big as Elvis. And some of y'all don't like that, but he's bigger than LeBron. Right? Okay, forget it. Y'all not being fair. Jesus was fire. Okay. I'm trying to help y'all. And so here's the thing, Mary, he had a disciple named Mary, not Mary his mother, not Mary of Magdalene, or Mary Magdalene, Mary of Magdala, not that Mary, not Martha and Mary, but another Mary who had a son named John who was also called Mark. Um, he's, he actually, most people will agree that he is the Mark um, not only that you see later on in the book of Acts, John Mark, who travels with Paul and Barnabas and, and winds up being part of the ministry team there, but also the same Mark that wrote the gospel, the book of Mark. His mama was a follower of Jesus, and she had a home there. In fact, you can read in the Bible where the disciples and, 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 and even Jesus would talk about stopping by and doing things, and so... Um, I, I can't remember, recall right off, or I'd give you the scripture reference, but it talks about how he would m eat meals and things, um, or at least on one occasion, a meal there. But, so long story short, it's most likely that it was this home of Mary. Now, some people believe that it was the home of Nicodemus, um, which perhaps could be. Um, but a lot of scholars believe that it was this, this home of Mary and this disciple John, um, or John Mark. Which would make sense because I want to show you another little tidbit that, that we can't prove. But a lot of people um, in their studies and all believe is, is actual. Um, do you remember when Jesus was arrested in the garden? How many of you remember the story of when Jesus was arrested in the garden? Do you remember? Now you only see this in the book of Mark. Now the reason I say that you only see this in the book of Mark because it's important because the writers of the Bible, much like those of us who are doing things like I, you know, I was messing around with you a little while ago thinking, saying, dear Pastor John, you're so pretty, right? Right? You should say, yes you are. Thank you. So we will include sometimes things in, in our own writings that, or our own stories that other people wouldn't say about us. You know, John, in the book of John, calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved because he had a very close relationship with Jesus. In fact, he was the one, the Bible says, was laying on Jesus' breast. He was laying up against his chest while they were reclining there. And Peter looks over and goes, psst, psst, hey. Ask him who he's talking about, right? Because Jesus is talking about Judas, but none, all of them were sitting there. By the way, does that not mess you up? Can I just segue for a second, time out on the message? Here we go. 
all the disciples are sitting around in the same upper room having just had communion and foot washing with Jesus. And Jesus says, <clears throat> one of y'all is going to betray me. And they're all so messed up following Jesus for three years and you think you're messed up. Listen, they're with, they're with Jesus. One of them walked on water with him. Peter was so messed up at the time, he didn't even know if Jesus was talking about him or not. Right? Isn't that amazing? Hey, ask him if he's talking about me. And you say, wow. It just I want to help you because you're not perfect. And sometimes you think, I should be perfect and I should know all these things and I should be doing, I shouldn't have these thoughts and I shouldn't have these failings and I shouldn't have all of this stuff. But these guys, literally, one of them walked on water with Jesus and still messed up. So, you're going to be all right. Keep trusting in Jesus. All right? Is that all right? Is that good? I won't charge you a single thing for that. Is that that's, that's good. You're welcome. So, here's the thing. They're all sitting around there. So, John says, the disciple whom Jesus loved, right? And John knew he was fast, so he talked about how he outran Peter, right? Because Peter would never say it, so he had to brag on himself. I outran that joker to the tomb, Right? So Mark is writing this gospel, and you see this in the book of Mark. And I don't know if, I was talking about somebody this the other day, and again, I, you can't prove this 100%, but a lot of people believe it's factual. And when you look at it, it really kind of makes sense. But out of nowhere in the book of Mark, when Jesus is arrested, they, they, people are following him, right? Y'all know that. Most of the disciples did what? How many of you know what they did? Ran. Peter grabbed a sword, right? Peter grabbed a sword. Whoop, he knocks the guy's ear off. Jesus, amazingly, I mean, I don't know why every guard there, especially that guy, didn't become a Christian on the spot. Jesus reached down, picks up his ear, puts it back on the side of his head. No stitches required. Amen. Right? Here, you're okay. At that point, I would have really said, I'm with him. You know what I mean? They're like, we're looking for Jesus. <laughs> you know, I'm him. They all fall down. The Bible says when he said that, the power of God went out of him. The Ruach, that same Holy Ghost that we're talking about right now, went out of him so strongly that they all fell over as dead. And then they got back up. At that point, I would have been like, okay, I can't do this anymore. I'm not, there's something different about this guy. But that just shows you how big delusion is and how strong deception is. That literally witnessing miracles and experiencing the power, the created power of God himself did not even stop them in their deception and delusion. So you better be careful. You, you, that's a good point for you to understand. But anyways, in the midst of all this story, we know what happened. Some of them ran off. Two guys stayed close to them. You know who they were? Peter and John, they stayed real close. And then the Bible says somebody else was following them. And you only see this in Mark. It's a guy, it's a young man, and he's wrapped in a bed sheet. And they realize he's somebody, they think that you were, you were with Jesus. And they turned around to grab him, and either to ask him what he's doing or to arrest him or to whatever. But the Bible says that he took off running and he ran home naked. He ran right out of the bed sheet to keep from getting arrested. And here's the thing. The theory, that, and, and what a lot of people believe, and it makes sense to me, is that because they were staying in that upper room, and because it was Mary who was the mother of John Mark, and John Mark who was also a follower of Jesus and later would become one of his big disciples in the book of Acts. He's not mentioned a lot, but he did a lot of things. That he heard the commotion, and it was actually Mark that was following him wrapped in the sheet. And that's why you only read that in the book of Mark. Now, some people think it's a prophetic thing about Jesus on the cross and being buried, and it's possible. I don't want to tell you. I, I can't tell you the, the gospel truth but I think that that is a true account and if you ask me I believe it was or at least very very likely possibly was Mark and so I'm saying all that for us to understand that 
it would make sense that this is where they were and this is and see we don't think about stuff like that when we read the bible we don't make those connections and, you know it's really simple you know when somebody goes well you know well you know how did how did how does so and so know so and so well we're friends and we work together and then they would then you know and it's like oh wow that makes sense and we read the bible and was and it's all this giant thing but we don't realize that it's everyday practicality that's involved in it right and so who are these 120 followers that wind up in the upper room? Well, we know that the 11 remaining apostles were there, minus Judas, right? You see that in Acts chapter 1, verse 13. We also know that Jesus' mother, his brothers, and his sisters were there, which, in fact, is amazing that his brothers were were there because we see earlier that they weren't really around a lot and when he was there that they, they kind of was like wait a minute you know who are you aren't you our brother why, why don't you build a chair or something you know what I mean and that just goes to show you can I just tell you what you can learn from this practically is sometimes the people who theme, seems like it should support you the most they will doubt you the most because they know you better than everybody except how you know yourself and so don't be so hard on them. Don't be so hard on them when you say, the Lord changed me, God's called me to do this, I'm going to take care of that. I'm gonna, especially when they have the experience of seeing you go through all the problems. We watched a movie last night about a mom who had these struggles in her life and her son. The, son, the movie was really about his life, but he kept having flashbacks to his mom and his mom was an addict, and, it, and over and over she would fail and fall, and, and she would keep saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And you know what? Eventually she did do that, but it took a long time for people to believe her because they saw her fall so much. And sometimes it's the people who are the closest to you that you're going to have to prove yourself to. Now, you don't have to prove yourself to God. All you got to do is just live and trust in Him. Amen? But sometimes you do have to prove some things to people and you shouldn't be offended about that because you made the bed and now you've got to live in it for a little bit. Amen? It's a fact. But the best witness you'll have in those circumstances, let me help you with this, the best witness you'll have with the people who are the closest to you is not what you tell them, it's what you show them. It's how you live, how you love, let them see the change. And so we see Jesus' his mother and brothers and his sisters were there. And among them, the Bible also says, the women were there. The women were there. Everybody say the women. The women. The women. Now, listen, for before you go crazy and get all offended at me, I'm not, I'm not going to get off on no, no uh, gender mess and, 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 and all that stuff. But I do want to say this, I believe, I know for a fact, and I want you to know and you need to understand that God calls and anoints women to do ministry in His kingdom work. Somebody say amen. amen. And He's done it from the very beginning. Amen. It's not like a new thing, it's not some liberal deal. But also, God never intended for women to do things that men are supposed to do, and He never intended for men to do things that women are supposed to do, and He never intended us for to pretend like we're somebody else. Amen. Or be deceived into thinking that we are someone else, or try to act like we are, or identify, or whatever else. Y'all understand what I'm saying? I'm not supporting any of this stuff, but I'm telling you that it's, a, it's an absolute fact, and so you get a lot of people to go, I don't want no woman preaching to me. Well, too bad for you because God uses them and they have amazing things to say. By the way, while I'm in this, can I just go ahead and stir it up a little bit more? It's amazing to me that the people say they don't want a woman preaching to them. They're fine with a woman doing everything in their life until they get old enough to say, I don't want a woman preaching to me. Mm. I'm going to let that one sit just a little bit. I didn't quit preaching and went to meddling, brother. That's all right. Send me the emails on that one. I'll be okay with it. So the women, the Bible says, were there. Jesus had lots and lots of people who were involved in his ministry. Many of them. 
And you know what? I, I, I don't know for sure, and I, I'm, I'm careful when I try to endorse certain things because people are like, the pastor said, that's right. And then if something comes out that wasn't right, they go, you said that was right. You know, I'm not trying to, I, I, I don't research every detail of every tiny little thing, but I watched season one of The Chosen, and many of you are watching season two right now, and I'm telling you, what I've seen so far in it, I can't tell you that every little thing is biblically accurate to the T. They do take some, hit, uh, what they call... Um, you know, what, what's it called, theatrical license or something like that where they have to assume conversations and stuff. But, but one thing I really, really do love is when they show the humanity and the love of Jesus that he had in his relationships. And one of the most powerful ones that they show is how he cared for people who were trapped in different bondages and things. And the, and the interaction that he had with Mary was amazing there. And I think that probably doesn't even go as far as the way Jesus really was because he was the most loving, amazing person that's ever walked the planet. And no, I don't think Jesus and Mary were married. And I don't think they had secret children. So don't go off that far. But listen, what happened in her life changed her so radically that everything about her ended. And all she existed to do at that point was to follow, serve, and love Jesus. I wished I could say the same thing about me. I love Jesus. I follow Jesus. I serve Jesus. But I got other things going on in my life. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Y'all understand what I'm saying, right? I'm not saying that, that I'm bad. I'm not saying I'm shortcoming. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying... Everything ended. She didn't ask nobody's permission. You ever, you ever notice, you ever, you ever realize that Peter was married? We know for a fact at least one of the disciples was married. Because the Bible talks about Peter's mother-in-law. Where was Peter's wife during the three and a half years he was traveling all around the country with this preacher? Did Peter go home and ask permission? Did Peter say, hey, by the way, y'all, I'm not going to be able to fish for the next three years. I don't know how you're going to make it. I don't know what's going to take place. I got to go be with Jesus. We don't know about all that. All we know is it so impacted their lives that they had to go and do, and they trusted God to take care of everything else. And he obviously did. I don't know if you think about stuff like that, but listen, life is made up in this word right here. Everything that you need, all the practical little details, and people think, well, I need to understand something. They run to their friends. If you will get in the word, it'll tell you what you need. So who else was there? i got to hurry up. My goodness. Mary Magdalene. Mary, the mother of James, Salome, Joanna, and probably others were most likely there. The reason we know that, the reason we assume that, is because we know they were followers of Jesus back then, and they continued to be followers of Jesus and work in the ministry, and they're talked about and named, and not only in the Bible, but also in, in historical documents. And so we would, it would be natural to assume that they were there, many of them were there at the resurrect at the crucifixion. They were there at the resurrection. In fact, the first person Jesus saw after he was resurrected was a woman, the first one to the tomb. And so, be careful when you think you know what you know, because you don't know what you know, and you sure don't know what you think you know. Amen? Amen? So what were they doing gathered together in this place? Well, Acts chapter 2, Luke doesn't specifically tell us again what exactly what they were doing when the Holy Spirit was sent. However, he tells us previously that they had been in prayer together. And we also know that they've been eating together and that Jesus was with them at one point in that same room. So what happened? When these 120 people gathered together in the upper room, perhaps eating and praying together. I mean, they were there for 10 days. It's possible that they ate something. Maybe they fasted for 10 days. Perhaps they did. I don't know. Somehow I doubt it. But what we do know is that God sent the Holy Spirit to the room where they were. 
This is what Jesus told them was going to happen, and this is exactly what happened, but they had to be where he told them to be, or they would have missed it. In fact, you know, I often have said in the past, and somebody pointed it out to me, and so I'll admit that it's an assumption of mine that there was 500 people at the Mount of Olives, or at least 500, when Jesus ascended into heaven. You know, when he went up and they say, this same Jesus, right? How many of you have assumed before that there was 500, at least 500 people there, right? And I've even talked about why were there 500 that heard him say go to the upper room or go wait in Jerusalem and only 120 there. But the Bible doesn't really say there were 500 there when he ascended to heaven. It just said he appeared to more than 500 people. So there were lots of people that saw him alive. Lots of people. There were only 120 in the room. And the point is this. It's very possible, very probable, that there were more than 120 that heard him say, go and wait, but only 120 that were willing to go and wait. And so when you look around, when God's calling you, when God's asking you, when you decide, I'm going to do this for the Lord, when you decide, it's time for me to take the next step, when you decide, I'm going to buckle down and it's enough, enough, no more games, no more messing around with this thing right here. I've got to do this. Don't be surprised when the crowd gets smaller. Don't be discouraged when the crowd gets smaller. Uh, Tommy Tenney said this in, in, in one of his books. He said, the deeper you went into the temple, the smaller the crowd got until eventually there was one with God. And it's okay if it's just you and God. Because one day it's just going to be you and God. And that needs to always be enough for you. Amen? Amen? I told you we were going to look at this and see what this has to do with us now. Hopefully you're gleaning a little bit of this stuff. So the Holy Spirit had previously worked in the earth, but we see him now working differently than he ever has before. And, and, and so all of this is happening. And according to what Jesus told his disciples, he said, wait for the promise of the Father. And Peter later said, he received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was now working in a new manner. So that was the setting of the day of Pentecost. On that, that Pentecost that was 50 days after Jesus was crucified, 10 days after he, he ascended into heaven. But what exactly was going on with the disciples? I want to cover this, these last few points kind of quickly. But I want, to, I want to tell you some things here because it's fascinating to me to try to speculate and imagine what's going on behind the scenes that you don't see or that you don't have things that tell you this is what they were thinking, this is what they were doing, this is what they were believing. So it's fascinating for me to speculate on the condition of Jesus' followers on the days between his ascension and the time that the Holy Spirit came. They had every reason to be fearful. They had every reason to wonder what the future was going to be like. They had every reason to stay hidden and stay out of the city. They were arresting people. They were killing people for following Jesus. They were killing people that were associated. They were taking everybody they could. That's why these guys took off running. That's why they were hiding for their lives. you got to look at the, 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 the power of the progression of this upper room. They go from the Last Supper and heartbreak to hiding and fearing for their lives to Jesus walking in where they were and saying, Here I am. Put your hand here. Then the next time they're there, they're there together. They're there boldly. They're not hiding anymore. The Bible says they were there for 10 days in the place where they were afraid for their lives. What happened? What was different? Well, here's the condition. The Bible tells us that they would gather together in one accord. This is big. This is important. I'm only going to take care of this for just a few seconds, but you need to get this because this is a key to much of the success in every relationship in your life, especially within the church body, the kingdom of God, and your relationship in God himself. They were in 
agreement. Everybody say agreement. 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 That's what it means when they were in one accord. They were there for one purpose. They were of one mind, of one spirit. They were there for one reason. Jesus told them to be there, and they were there waiting on what he promised. They didn't know what the promise was. They didn't know how it was going to come. They didn't know what it was going to be like when it came. But they were all in agreement that this was a reason to be there, and we will not leave until it happens. And I want to tell you something. The power of agreement in God's promise is so strong that God had to disrupt and disband every human being on the planet in different directions at a place called Babel. Or we often call it Babel. Anybody remember that? Because Jesus made, or God made this statement in the, in the Old Testament. He said, now that they are of one mind, they're in agreement, they're doing things together, and nothing will be able to stop them. They'll be able to do anything they put their mind to. That is so powerful. Why do you think the devil tries to stir up mess in the church all the time? Why do you think we have to argue on color of the carpet, color of the chairs? I don't like the lights on the wall. I wish we'd sing them old songs. I don't like, I like the new songs. I hate the old, look, all of that is important to us. But in the grand scheme of things, it don't matter at all because it's just something that the devil uses to try to mess us up because he knows if we can get together in agreement, in one mind, in one purpose, the promise of God will be fulfilled and nothing that we put our mind to in Christ will be stopped. I'm preaching a whole lot better than you letting on. They were in one mind. They were in one accord. They were in agreement. Don't you let the devil make you have division. Listen, I'm not saying your preferences are important. Because they are. I'm not saying your personal opinions aren't important. Because they are. I'm not saying that that what you like or what you dislike isn't important because at some level it is. But nothing that we want, nothing that we desire, nothing that we prefer, nothing that we know supersedes and outweighs the, the, the purpose and the mindset that we need to have in God. And if it don't go our way, we need to learn how to pull up our big boy and big, boy, big girl britches and say, well, it didn't go my way this time, but I'm still one in Christ with the family of God. That's good preaching, Melissa. You amen me back here? Amen. There you go. I ain't getting much from over there. I got to have something this way. Hit a chord or something. Me. Now I see why my black brothers like to have the organ player behind them because at least they're getting some help from the back. You know what I'm saying? It's all right. Y'all doing good. Here's the action. The condition was this. They were in agreement. The action was, was what they were doing. They were praying for 10 days. Well, did they pray nonstop? I doubt it. They probably slept some. They ate some. Some of them probably had to go to the bathroom once or twice. But they were about a spirit of prayer. You want the promises of God to take place in your life? You want the fulfillment of God to happen? You want Pentecost to happen in your life over and over and over again? Let me tell you what you need to do. Stay in prayer. Pray. The Bible, you know when the Bible says to pray? The Bible says pray always. Pray always in all things. Well, I got to go to sleep. That's all right. Go to sleep praying. When you wake up, start praying. Even if it's just thank you, Lord. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Pray about all things. I don't have time to pray about all things. I got a job to do. You got time to pray about all things, even if it's just what I call little whisper prayers. Thank you, Lord. Help me for this. Help me with this. I see sometimes people. How many? Of you, how many of you see? Facebook makes it makes it so easy to do, to be a hypocrite, don't it? And this is what I mean by that. You see somebody who says, "Y'all pray for me. I got a big thing going on in my life right now." And you'll say, "Praying," right? Because you want to encourage them, let them know you're there to support them. How many of you really stop and pray right then? If you ain't praying right then, don't write praying. Right, we'll pray. You know what I write? Praying or have prayed. Because when I write it, I pray. Even if it's just this. If Haley writes something and says, y'all pray for me. I'll just say, Lord, I don't know what's going on in Haley's life. 
but help her right now in the name of Jesus. Is that enough? Yes, enough! Because it's sincere. And I'm talking to my father. And hers too. How about that? Your father talking to your father. Imagine that one. And then they were busy. They were determined that they had to replace what they saw as an entity. Now this is important. Because they recognize that Jesus established something. A ministry. A movement. He called it the church. He said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And at one point, it was small. It was just 12 of them. And then it grew and grew and grew. And then it spread out. And then it shrank. And then it started growing again. And they determined when they got there and they got busy, they weren't afraid anymore. They said a promise is coming. But you know what we need to do? We need to get back like Jesus made us. He gave us 12 and we need 12. Where'd that come from? Jesus didn't tell them to do that. It became important to them. They followed what I believe was the direction of the Holy Spirit in their discernment. And they knew that, they, listen, we need to make sure that above all things, the kingdom of God moves forward. Are you following me? The kingdom of God moves forward. In everything you do in your life, you need to find a way to make sure that the kingdom of God is moving in it. And you're doing it. The Bible says everything you do, do it with excellence as unto the Lord. If you can't do it as unto the Lord, you need to find something else to do. But in everything you do, you need to be advancing the kingdom, thinking about the kingdom, doing something so people can know Jesus, so people can know that you love the Lord or He loves you. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Well, that sounds crazy, Pastor. It's not crazy. That's life. That's who we're supposed to be. Peter explains it quite clearly. After quoting Psalm 69 and 109, he says this, it's necessary that of the men who have accompanied us from the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us from the very beginning with the baptism of John until the day he was taken from us, that's the ascension, one of these must become a witness to his resurrection. So in other words, they said, we got to keep the ministry going. They weren't satisfied. that They, were, they didn't say, well, there's 11 of us. It'll be all right. They said, no, we got to keep it going. Somebody's got to step up. Somebody's got to do it. And that's another good lesson for us. Amen? I don't have time to stop there. How's that for vision? They went from fearful hiding to planning the advancement of the kingdom in the same room. I think it's safe to say that disciples and followers of Jesus were not hiding in the upper room or cowering or fearful for those 10 days. Instead, they were convinced of the truth of who Jesus was and were determined to make his identity and his purpose known. They were waiting with great expectations. They didn't have a clue who or what they were waiting for, but they knew it was coming because they were making plans to do things after it showed up. When God calls you, when God plants something in you, when God says, I'm going to do something for you, don't just sit around and go, well, when God gets ready, he'll do it. When God gets ready, you do something. You, get, you do something. The Bible says, occupy until he comes. Get busy. Do what you know to do. If you, all you can do is pray, then you just pray. Sometimes we need to help the Lord. Amen? That's a fact. He doesn't need our help, but sometimes we, better said, sometimes we need to help ourselves so God can help us. I would imagine that a text like Habakkuk 2 and 3 would have been remembered for the vision is yet to the, for the appointed time. It hastens toward the goal and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come and it will not delay. Here's something else I want you to understand. The same expectation that these guys had. Now you gotta understand that this was the second time in 40 days that Jesus had been taken from them. The first time in their utter 
disbelief and heartbreak through crucifixion. Then Jesus is alive three days later. He's alive. He's walking around with us. He's talking. He's teaching us stuff. He's cooking breakfast for us. He's walking in and out of walls, in and out of rooms. He's preaching and encouraging us. He's calling us and making promises. He's talking about the kingdom. He's talking about the second coming. All right, Jesus is back. And then all of a sudden, here he goes again. No wonder they were just standing there looking up in heaven like, I can't believe this is happening all over again. But then they heard another promise when the angel of God said, Men of Jerusalem, why are you standing gazing into heaven like you are? This same Jesus will come again just like he left. So go and take care of what he told you to do. We know that they believed it because they went right where he said and did exactly what he said and did not leave until the promise showed up. And when the promise showed up, it set them on fire to do their kingdom work. Now, here we are thousands of years later with the hindsight benefit of being able to see exactly what's happening. And we need every tiny little thing and grandma saying it's going to be all right. And the preacher calling us 15 times a week and everybody else helping just so we can pray. Come on, somebody. We're Pentecostal people. This is the day of Pentecost. Are we not filled with the power of God? Are we not walking in the presence of the Shekinah glory of God Himself? We have everything that makes God God dwelling in us, the Holy Ghost. Don't get quiet on me. I know it's 1214. You need to replace that groaning your belly's doing for chicken and let it do some groaning for some moving of the Spirit of God in your life one more time. I'm going to finish up in a minute. Promise. The Bible says when the day had fully come, they were together in one place and suddenly. Say it again, Jeff. Suddenly. Boy, I want to tell you what, if you'll trust God, if you'll depend on God, you're going to be walking around and everything ain't right and everything's not good. And my baby's at home right now with the concussion in the front and the back and her neck so locked up she can't hardly do nothing but look her eyes sideways. But you know what? God, the Holy Ghost is working on her and working in her body. And I believe that suddenly, one of these days, very soon, she's going to wake up and be able to go, Woo! My neck's better. My head doesn't hurt. See, we just meander through this life if we trust God. And all of a sudden, just like that, everything's the same until it isn't. And God's going to move. Suddenly. He's still in the suddenly business. He's still the same God that promised the same things. Suddenly. Come on, somebody. Ephesians 5, 15 through 20. I'm going to end with this. Provides for us the application of it all. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. Making the most of your time, because the days are evil. All right, look, just, just like the disciples were following Jesus in Acts chapter 1, we have to be careful to do what he said to do. Amen. He said, go to the upper room. What do you think about if they would have went to the temple courts? Well, he didn't really say go to the upper room. He said, go and wait together. And so they went to the upper room. How about if they would all spread out and go, well, y'all, y'all boys, look. Jesus knows where to find me. He found me the first time. I ain't seen my wife in three years. I want some fish. Y'all understand? You don't get to do things. I, 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 this is what we don't like about God. But we need to understand it's His promise, it's His kingdom. And He gets to make the rules because He will fulfill. He knows more than we know, He knows better than we know. You do not do things on your own terms. You have to do them on God's. Now that's good preaching. It's hard to take sometimes, but it's good. The text continues this way. So then do not be foolish, 
But understand what the will of the Lord is. See, foolish folks are the ones who take no account of God, who do not seek His will, but carelessly go their own way. Everybody say their own way. Then it goes on. And don't get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit. Aha! The will of God is that we wait for, look for, and receive the Holy Spirit. In all His wonderful forms and ways. Then it goes on to say this. Speaking to one another. Or you can interpret that as speaking to yourselves, that is your inner man and your own reflections. In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. And so what it says is, you want to know the will of God? Do what He says do. Wait and be filled with His Spirit and encourage one another. Live like you got God inside of you. That's what it says. Now I want to show you something right here and I'm going to stop. Because I didn't talk today about Pentecost and tongues and power and gifts. That's coming. You get ready for it. Many of you said I heard it before. You need it again because we don't see it in our lives like we should. But here's what I want you to see. I'm glad that I'm a Pentecostal Christian. I'm glad that I pastor a Pentecostal church and I hope that you are too. And I think that every single one of us needs to be Pentecostal Christians. Because it seems to me that's the intent and the purpose of God from the very beginning. Now, you choose not to believe it, that's between you and God. I ain't going to down you for it, I ain't going to dog you for it, and it certainly isn't a heaven or hell issue. But I'll tell you this, I want you to understand this. Jesus said, you shall receive power. Everybody say power. Power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So, what's it like in the, in the Holy Ghost? One, one most certainly is power. Evidence is another one. Evidence. Everybody say evidence. What does that mean? Proof that I'm a Christian. Proof that I've been changed. Proof that I've been filled with the power of God. And so in the Pentecostal realm, the next thing coming is what? Say it when you know it. It's okay. What's the evidence? Come on, y'all. Speaking in tongues. Why do we say that? Anybody know? Because it's the first thing they did that stood out every time the Spirit of God came on them. But here's what I want to tell you. I want you to have the tongues. I want you to have the prophecy. I want you to have the interpretation of the tongues. I want you to have wisdom and knowledge and miracles and gifts. I want you to have all seven or nine, depending on how you look at them, gifts of the Spirit. But you know what else I want you to have? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And everybody say self-control. My goodness. We got some people that can talk in tongues in 14 different ways and they so mean to people their own mama don't like being around them. We need the whole package. Amen? We need all of God that we can take. That's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is anyways. He said, I want you to have all of me. But more importantly, can I tell you this? And you'll hear about this coming up again. It really ain't about how much of God you got. What it's about is how much of you does God have. Because I have people tell me all the time, the Holy Ghost. I got the Holy Ghost. I got the Holy Ghost. And I say, well, that's good for you, but it's evident the Holy Ghost ain't got you. Well, Pentecost, then and now, it's no different. I'm saying all I said today, take time and and effort and energy to, to leave you with this thought. The same purpose, the same calling, the same power, 
The same mission is still the same one then as it was now. People need Jesus. And they need us to tell them and show them. And we need the power of God and Pentecost in our lives to be able to accomplish the kingdom work that he called us to do. And however that looks and however that sounds, you can't do it on your own. If you could, God wouldn't be involved in it. Amen. Amen. I pray you've received something from this. Congratulations again to our graduates. I'm excited about what God's going to do. I'm excited about what God's doing. I'm excited about how God's going to use you to do it. Some of you think you're busy right now. Let me tell you something. You ain't seen nothing yet. God's got stuff in store for you that's going to blow your mind. And you say, well, that scares me. It's all right. It scares me sometimes. But I know he's good, so he ain't going to do nothing to hurt me. He's God. Amen? And he's going to equip me to do everything he calls me to do. Amen, somebody. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your calling. Thank you for your promise. Thank you for the, for the reality of Pentecost in our lives and your Holy Spirit that fills us and empowers us and equips us and walks with us, talks with us, not just in us, but around us, through us, for us. Thank you for all you are and all you do. Thank you for the fullness of your power. God, I pray that we would look at this simple message that I've preached today and what these men and women did in preparing for your promise and getting ready for what's going to come and, and at how we can apply these simple principles to our life today. To do your work, to listen to what you say, to be faithful to what you do, to be ready, to be prepared, to be expecting, to be willing. Because you're going to make us able. God, I'm excited about what you have in store for new life. I'm excited about what's to come. Because I know that ahead of us may be some of the most tumultuous times that we've ever lived. But at the same time, the most exciting opportunities and the most powerful walk that we've ever had with you. I thank you and I bless you, Lord. Use us. If you can use anything, Lord, you could use us. Here we are, God. We sang the song about Isaiah, and I'll end this prayer with that same example. As I look to you and say, here I am, Lord, send me. Oh, congregation, would you pray that with me right now? Would you just say that to the Lord? If you mean it in your heart, here I am, Lord, send me. Send me, God. Send me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I love you with the love of the Lord. The Lord be with you. Have a great day.